Hello and welcome to the Eastern Kicks podcast, a regular magazine program about East Asian film led by me, Andrew Heskins, founder and grandmaster of EastonKicks.com, and James Mudge, our leading writer. Hey, up. Each episode, we'll be taking a look at the latest films, news, and festivals, often chatting to filmmakers and stars along the way. Welcome to our latest show. This time, we're delighted to be joined by senior lecturer in film studies, Jonathan Root, who's here to chat about his new book, The Paths of Zatoichi. We'll come on to everybody's favourite blind sword for hire in a moment. Uh, not that there's many. Um, but <laughs> first, let's ask the important question on the podcast. What's everyone drinking this episode? Perhaps, Jonathan, you can start. Mm. Um, yeah, I've brought along, everyone seems to be appreciating it, um, some Japanese whiskey, <laughs> Tenjaku uh, blended whiskey from Japan, and we're all enjoying it, I think. It's oh, yeah, that's awesome. smooth. It's, it's very, very, very nice. Good. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> Shall I go next? Yeah, I've got uh, some uh, leftover Delirium Christmas. <laughs> leftover? <laughs> that makes it sound like you've found half a bottle. You know I'll, finish <laughs> that. I'll finish this off. Well, some of us aren't from north of the border, James. Um, true, true. Uh, and that's 10% out of volume. Wow. Um, and I, you know, from such sublime drinks, uh, I'm drinking McEwan's. <laughs> from north of the border. But it is McEwan's champion, which is allegedly award-winning. And is, it's almost like a super strength. It's a proper 7.3% folly. Ooh. So I think today, this is one, I will say this is one of the best quality collections of drink we've had on the podcast. It truly is. It's really, it truly it's is. It's very good. So, well, cheers, guys. Cheers. cheers. So let's get on. Um, I think we can, we'll, we'll chat about the situation in a, in a second. I think one thing that's really nice to start with, though, is how you got into Asian film, mm. Jonathan. I think, you know, we, we all kind of fall into these things and, and you, 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 <laughs> you have to kind of seek it out once you've got the bug. So what, what was it for you? Oh, that's taking me back. I think it was, if if you want to get to where it technically started, it was me recording horror films with my VHS player when I was a teenager <laughs> that were playing late night on Channel 4. Mm. Um, this was must have been the late 90s, early 2000s. Around that time, Mark Kermode was introducing a lot of them, yes. if not someone else, but I just distinctly remember Mark Kermode introducing a few. And I think Caught Up In There was where I first got into, surprise, surprise, The Usual Suspects, Ring and Battle mm. Royale. Mm. Um, so got into it from there um, not long after that I went to university um, oh, before I went to university I was just starting to get into anime so I saw Akira of course mm. that, was a, that was a big watershed moment a friend introduced, introduced me to that and then um, got to university I got even more interested in, in Japanese cinema and I think if I remember this rightly just coming across some of the shelves of the DVDs they had in the library at the time that you could uh, borrow um, they they had a few Takeshi Kitano films. I'm pretty sure they had Violent Cop, oh. and I I started getting really interested to him. Like, who's this guy? What's this all about? Mm -hmm. Blown away by Violent Cop. Mm -hmm. um, still one of my favourite Kitano films, and um, ended up doing my whole undergrad dissertation on um, uh, Takeshi Kitano's films at the time that mm -hmm. were available. So this was around when did I complete that? That was around. 2005, 2006, I was, I was writing about that when I was an undergrad at Winchester. Mm -hmm. I also had to buy a lot of, uh, they weren't so expensive then, they're, they're blooming expensive now as we were mentioning earlier. <laughs> I had to buy a, at the time a lot of academic books on Japanese cinema because there was no Asian cinema <laughs> scholar there at Winchester so I had to self-teach myself all this. So reading, <laughs> reading about what films I couldn't watch and watching as much Kitano films as I could. And uh, that's uh, uh, another good reason for me to mention that is that actually one of my projects leading up to my dissertation on Takeshi Kitano was around that time, you know, uh, 2005, 2006. So it was only a couple of years before his remake of Zatoichi came out, mm. um, which, you, you know, you, you don't hear of this happening a lot, a lot now with Japanese films. But that was mm. that was in almost, well, it was in a lot of cinemas across the UK, probably not every yes. cinema yeah. in the UK. And it got quite a wide DVD release yes. um, afterwards, um, so that was that was how I got introduced to the character, and mm. I did I, I did end up I think it was an imported DVD. I en did end up tracking down the first Shintaro Katsu Zatoichi film, and I ended up doing a little uh, undergraduate project there, comparing mm. the original sixty two one to what Kitano had done in two thousand and three, because we'd just <laughs> cool. been we'd just been told a. Uh, mode of understanding genre studies and mm -hmm. breaking down story structure 
through um, basically this was an adaptation of Vladimir Prop. I, I'll try and I'll make this very short. I won't turn this into an academic lecture. <laughs> um, it was a breakdown of Vladimir Prop's morphology of the folk tale, basically arguing mm-hmm. that most stories, especially fairy tales, he was arguing at the time, follow a similar structure, and. Uh, an academic, David Dessa, had adapted this basically to samurai films, arguing okay. that they all follow a similar structure. So I used that to compare the 62 Zatoichi film to the 2003 one. Right. And basically arguing, yes, you can argue structurally and plot-wise they're very similar, but this doesn't take into account the visuals and everything else that, that Kitano changed with his remake to make it very distinguished in, in his own. I, I, that's something that I, I was going to ask probably later as well, but we're if we're mentioning it now, like, so is that a, is it a remake the Kitano one, or is it you know a remake of one specific film, or is it you know what I mean, or is it an adaptation of the, the source novel? What's that, the status? That, that's a really interesting question because there's lots of different mentions of this, mm. and it doesn't help with Kitano himself, as you probably heard. I mean, you're <laughs> off to Udine soon, aren't you, Andrew? Yeah, yeah, yeah he's, he's yeah. going to be there, yeah. isn't yeah. he? Um, which I'm very jealous of. <laughs> that is cool. I don't yeah. know. He's, he may not be too exposed to the public about yeah. coming on to... No, I've, to I've, heard, his, I've heard that his appearances are very brief, and then... Mm. Yeah. yeah he might, uh, but um, <laughs> what, uh, one thing I have heard, and, and funnily enough, I, I reminded myself of this recently on some of the extras on the uh, special edition Zatoichi... DVD of his his Zatoichi film, um, Kitano doesn't help with kind of you learning the the actual story as okay. to the impetus of the film's production because he seems to tell a different one to every single journalist that he talks to <laughs> in terms of why this film got made. Um, I would say that the uh, so it's still a really interesting question because I would say that the 2003 film isn't a direct remake of one of the Zatoichi films. Apparently, okay. there were elements of this based on a story that wasn't made into a Zatoichi film. Oh, okay. as, uh, uh, apparently, yeah. um, because what happened with again, we were talking about this just before the podcast, and I'm, I'm happy to explain again. Um, you know, uh, Shintaro Katsu got very famous mm. for playing the Zatoichi character, but he also had. Uh, a, a, a notorious other side to his star persona, you know, being quite notorious off screen, you know, womanizer, drinker, mm. did get arrested for drugs a few times. You can, you can <laughs> Google this and find these news stories yourself. Um, eventually, that led to financial troubles, and he actually ended up selling the rights to the Zatoichi character at one point to this uh, woman called Chieko Saito. Um, who approached Takeshi Kitano to make the film, and he was initially very reluctant. He sa- he says this in almost every interview he's given about Zatoichi. Yeah. Um, he he said he didn't want to step into Shintaro Katsu's shoes because he's still so recognised even mm. by the early two thousands, and you could still argue to this day. I think you can argue that with some of the later remakes that came on uh, uh, came. Uh, uh, came out of Japan based on that character, but I'll come back to that later. So he was initially very reluctant, but he was convinced to do this. Um, he says he largely came up with the story originally, but he might have borrowed some elements on something that Chieko Saito had access to um, mm-hmm. that might be an unmade Zatoichi film. So it's not a direct remake of the older series. It's kind of um, the, uh, another word that was coming into my mind le- earlier when you asked the question it's it's almost a kind of a reimagining and okay. you could say in some ways with what happens at the film a kind of an homage to what Katsu did but he's also trying to be very original and unique as yeah. he, again Kitano said he wanted to do with the character by giving him a completely different costume completely mm-hmm. different scabbard the cane that he holds mm. is red right. okay. um, and, and the hair colour of course this is where yes. Kitano first goes bleach blonde because mm. he's just like right I don't want anyone to associate <laughs> me with Shintaro Katsu mm. whatsoever yeah. <laughs> Does the does Kitano one uh, end with like a mad dance number? Like, yes, yes. Nice. I, I, I love that. That's my ringtone at the moment. I love that piece of music. I really do. Yeah. I'm, I, uh, full, I've, I've, full on dance now. Yeah, I've revealed myself now. Full on Zatoichi you know, That is my ringtone. I, just, I really love that piece of music, that, yeah. um, that sequence. Um, yeah, it just makes me smile um, every time I see it. Um, Kitano said he put that in there because a lot of these films, the Jidai Geki Shambara films, ended with a song and a dance scene okay. where, um, you know, everyone celebrated uh, Zatoichi or the other hero vanquishing the villain. We 
does happen actually in a few of the Zatoichi, uh, original Zatoichi films, but not every single one, but a lot of them do centre around um, festivals. Sometimes that's where the film will start. The Zatoichi will enter a village where a festival is taking place, then he finds out the Yakuza are trying to con everyone, and he eventually has to slay them all, as, as you expect in these films. Mm. As I was explaining earlier, they're very formulaic, this is yeah. the structure they follow, and sometimes the festival gets introduced later or, or earlier. Um, but Kitano decides to put that all at the end, and I think it works fantastically. That's the main thing I remember from that film, is the, yeah. is the song and dance ending and stuff. And I remember when it came out here, I think that was one of the... You know, for a lot of even like mainstream critics and things like that, that came as a big surprise because yeah. mm. this was coming out. What, what was it, two thousand and three? Yeah. So it was just, it was after stuff like Hero, Crouching Tiger, and everything. Which, and um, you know, Kill, Kill Bill, which was significant right. for the marketing because yes. I don't know if anyone remembers the poster. Um, they had a quote at the time from Jonathan Ross saying, "Kill Bills, after which you would wipe the floor with him." <laughs> That's how the film got marketed. <laughs> nice, <laughs> nice, but. Oh, yeah, I just remember a lot of the credit people being like, "What? Why is there music? What? Not that he didn't like it, but they were, yeah, people were yeah, just really yeah, surprised yeah. because, you know, for the mainstream audience, so they would obviously throw together stuff because that's what you hear yeah. and Crouch and Tiger and stuff. Mm. So they were just getting used to this sort of big Johnny Mo, Grandio is honestly not CCP that sort of style of stuff and everything, but then. You know, going into the situation, seeing, that, seeing yeah, a really yeah. joy, a joyful song and dance number there. I mean, it's cool. Yeah, it's really cool. Very interesting. Yeah, I think yeah. Um, a lot of Kitano fans would also be surprised as well. Possibly yeah. his fans in Japan, but mm. um, that's always been the interesting history with Kitano's films. He doesn't have that many fans of his films um, in Japan. <laughs> Though it changed with Zatoichi. I mean, if you if you're doing a remake of a beloved character like that, you yeah. know, you uh, there's no surprise that's still the most successful film of his career. Oh, um, but before that, um, you know, he didn't have that many fans in Japan. He had more fans internationally, getting used right. to his style and everything. Mm. Uh, Joe Hiseishi was mostly doing the music for his films. Mm -hmm. And then when Zatoichi comes along, he, he gets a completely different um, composer. Mm. And the uh, band, this is really annoying because I watched the DVD recently. <laughs> I forget the actual tap dance band who were brought in to choreograph okay. that end sequence. Um, no, it's gone. Sorry, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, easily, easily, uh, you can easily find those names: the composer and the the dance mm. group on on Google who do a great job. And I'm sure there's so many YouTube clips of that dance yes. sequence as well. It must, it must be so fun to watch, <laughs> and at ringtone as well. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that is, that's very cool. <laughs> So should we go kind of uh, head back to to the, the genesis of, of Zatoichi yeah. then? Uh, yeah. You know, what, what, you know, what what did he come out of? So I mean, I you know, and I have to say, I know as I've said to, to Jonathan, you know, I, I do have the the big criteria on set of all the films, um, which is which is which is a massive set, and it's the one that has the DVDs and the Blu-rays in and everything in mm. the booklet. Um, and it's pretty much unwatched so far, not because I don't <laughs> want to. Um, but in some ways, and we can come back to this a bit later, but it is quite a daunting thing to mm -hmm. think, oh, there's yeah. 25 films here, where do I, st you know, and yeah. obviously you start at the beginning, but, um, so what, what, where did he, where did the character mm. come from? No, I, I, I completely sympathise with you, it's a daunting <laughs> task, because I only made the time to commit to this, I don't know how I did it now, actually, it was back in 2014, <laughs> I watched 30 Zatoichi films in 30 days, Wow. Okay. and I, you know, <laughs> anyone that's keeping count at home, or maybe has the Wikipedia page open at the moment, knows that there's only 29 Japanese Zatoichi films, so I did sneak Blind Fury in yes. there cheaply as well, well it had to be which, which we'll come on to yeah. later. Yeah. 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 Um, so yeah, that I, I I tried establishing myself as a famous like blog person back in 2014. It didn't happen, but the blog is still there if people want to watch it and read how I feverishly wrote all this <laughs> stuff down. While I was watching it. Um, yeah, it is a daunting task, and I haven't done it recently myself. I was finding up until a few years ago, it was also difficult going through the TV series, which right. I had to go through as well for the purposes of writing the book. But I'll come back to that. Um, the the box set you have is a great place to kind of help with starting the story of Zatoichi because if anyone does have that already or is thinking of getting it what you also get in the booklet is the English translation of the original short story where the character turns up right. and this was okay. first published by Kan Shimozawa um, back in 1948 mm -hmm. uh, a lot of his short stories were first pub published in like serial format newspapers and magazines mm -hmm. um, but later on brought into compendium works and I think uh, that's credited in the Criterion booklet as to where they 
they got that translation which they've put now out into English. And it's a very different character. I mean, you, you, you both said you had brief knowledges of yeah, Zatowicz. Very, very and good, and yeah. we've started off talking about the Kitano mm. um, film, which, you know, some elements of the famous character that Shintaro Katsu established are, I would say, retained in that remake to a certain degree. But going back and reading the short story, it's mm. startling how different the character is. Because um, in most of the films, he's he's kind of established as being an enemy of the Yakuza, especially yeah. those that are out to corrupt the villages and towns around them and the, the peasants and the farmers. Mm-hmm. Um, in the short story, he's already established as an ally of the Yakuza and he, oh, actually, yeah. he actually polices the gambling dens where they're calling right. out, you probably know these from, from many Japanese yes. films, not just Satoichi films, where they're all mm. calling out Cho and Han mm. and he's actually policing them and anyone that causes trouble, he just comes in um, they can see he's blind, but he slices a cup or a coin in half, shows how good he is with the sword, and, and anyone that's causing trouble just shuts up. <laughs> so he's he's established in that story as that way, but once a... Um, ba- uh, very Give a bre- very brief synopsis of the story here, and not don't spoil it entirely, it's still worth reading yourself, but basically uh, a Yakuza boss in that story does something morally questionable that Zatoichi does not agree with and okay. ends up leaving. Yeah, his uh, employ, if you will, mm. and and he has a wife in this story as well. Okay. Uh, yeah, because yeah. uh, in most of the films he's like wandering yeah. and never settles down <coughs> or establishes a love interest or, or sets up mm. a family or anything like that. You, you see, sometimes he tries to attempt some of these things, but it never works out. Um, but in the short story, he has a wife. Okay, which is interesting. Um, so the, with the films then mm. is that like the first adaptation of it if this was 48 what was the first film 60 um, fil- first film yeah is 62, 62. Shintaro Katsu and yeah it's interesting how that came about as well as that first film mm. um, because uh, in the book I say that the roots of Zatoichi even start just just before that first film um with Shintaro Katsu's film career of course he didn't just land into it accidentally mm. there's actually a bit of build up to this um, also kind of a build up with where Daie were going and um, where this character came from uh, probably across a script writer because the writer of the story Kan Shimazara I'm trying to remember now as best as I can the other stories of his that were adapted on screen I think this came a bit after um, the first Zatoichi film but he wrote lots of other stories like Tales of the Shinsengumi the kind of elite samurai okay. warriors of the Tokugawa period and, and lots of other stories, sometimes about similar drifters to Zatoichi, sometimes based on the actual samurai rankings of the time and officers around. Um, so Daya uh, and some other studios were adapting a lot of these stories and then I think a script writer came across the, the Zatoichi story and got inspired to write a script. But before mm. that, actually, Zat, uh, sorry, Zatoichi, um, that's how he's known now, um, mostly, as Shintaro Katsu, sorry, had played a blind person before. Ooh, um, okay. The Blind Menace, a film from 1960, also known as, you, you might know it either as The Blind Menace or it's got two other titles, confusingly, <laughs> of course. Um, Agent Shiranui, I'm, I'm not sure where that comes from. Um, I might have misremembered part of the film. I'm sure it relates to part of the dialogue. Also called Secrets of a Court Masseur. <laughs> and this, this, is, yeah. this is an interesting contrast to how the heroic Zatoichi would be established in the film series because the, the blind Suga, Suga Noichi, I'm pretty sure that's his character's name, um, in The Blind Menace is a complete bastard, complete <laughs> villain. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he... Um, he is blind from a young age and you start to feel sympathy for him first of all but he realises if he can con people into sympathising him or he can get some money yeah. and he just gets greedier and greedier from there oh. leading to you know um, establishing relationships with the Yakuza so he can feed them information about who houses to rob and then it gets to um, you know uh, involving plots involving uh, deception rape, murder later mm-hmm. on um, he, he's a really nasty character. Also, also that he can become the kind of highest ranking and richest blind person in medieval Japan at the time. We're talking the, the classic samurai um, era <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, when these films are usually set, the Tokugawa era. So okay. 17th century to 19th century. Uh-huh. At that time, there was a ranking of blind people called the Kengyo. Okay. Um, because blind people could only enter into professions like music, being a masseur, or um, some of them, if they became particularly famous and wealthy, became money lenders. 
So Suga Noichi in this film, in The Blind Menace, uh, has this aim to become like the richest and most powerful Kengo ever, but he's doing it by nefarious means. Um, and that's that's what how he gets involved in murder deception. He becomes uh, incredibly, you know, leery and lustful as well. <laughs> so he uses this to manipulate women and and um, you know have them as possessions. Basically, even though he's blind, he's, yeah. it's amazing how he can still lust after women. Although you watch the trailer and you realise there's a dream sequence where he can see at some point. So he <laughs> seems to be dreaming of yeah. of naked women and those he admires. Um, <laughs> it, it sounds a, it sounds yeah. a bit laughable, but yeah. actually it's a really good film, and it, he 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 does really well in it. Um, Shintaro Katsu playing this complete you know, as I said, really horrible person. Mm. And um, it's, it's worth watching for his, appoint, uh, his his performance alone. And if anyone's familiar with primarily his work as Zatoichi, you might find it an interesting contrast. Yeah. Mm. Um, so he played that role, first of all. And th- again, there's some interviews that you can still find with Shintaro Katsu with him saying, oh, I know how to play a blind person because we used to have a blind servant in our in our household. Okay. And that's the story he tells. Mm. Mm. Um and so yeah after the success of the blind menace because it wasn't like a massive success but i think it was a moderate success for daie um shintaro katsu tries a few other starring roles because that was it i think that was his first lead role for daie um he'd only had supporting roles before that and then he tries to establish another long-running action series called akumyo where he's again a gangster type character. He doesn't have a sword here, but he's mainly he's mainly beating up other gangsters in rival gangs. Uh, Akumyo literally translates as tough guy. I think <laughs> it is. Um, so he thinks he's going to establish that. I think the first film in that series um, that that does end up being a long running series, about thirteen, fourteen installments. Okay. Um, he thinks that's going to be his big action series, and he'll um, and then he's offered to do. Um, the Tale of Zatoichi, Zatoichi Monogatari, which ends up coming out in 1962. Mm. And this is seen as something he can maybe do on the side. Oh, they asked me to play a blind character again. Okay, I'll do okay. it for this film. Which they intend as a one-off, because this is a very different kind of film for what the Zatoichi series became known for, mm. which the Kitano film is a good indicator of, mm-hmm. um, right. in terms of uh, Zatoichi coming across, you know, evil Yakuza that are either after him or want to corrupt the local town and and fleece them for all their money and him basically vanquishing the bad guys. Um, The tale of Zatoichi does have an element of that, um, but Ichi in it is incredibly reluctant to draw his sword. So you spend a lot of this film is like the build up to this coming violence um, it takes a lot of elements from the original short story, um, being about the rivalry between two, um, the, again, I've forgotten the names, really annoying. I've written, it's really <laughs> annoying when you've written a book on this subject and you forget the key names involved. Um, but it's about two rival gangs who are fighting over territory. One wants to take over the other. And it, Ichi is at first of all friends with one of these rival bosses who is desperate to pay Ichi as much as he, money as he can to be involved in this upcoming battle yeah. so that he can help him slaughter the bad guys because he already knows how good he is with a sword. Right. Um, you see a few tricks on screen showing uh, itchy skills with slicing coins, slicing candles, um, but you don't see him kill anyone until much later on in the film um, when he's kind of forced to, to defend himself mm. and then reluctantly he does get involved in the battle at the end. And it also includes the very famous... Uh, trope because this happens in a good few films afterwards as well of him uh, actually making friends with the rival gang's uh, samurai for hire or ro- uh, sorry sword for hire I should yeah. say Ronin because they're mm. no longer a samurai by that point mm. um, making friends with them before they have to fight to the death at the end of course there's always that, <laughs> that, that bit of tragedy yeah yeah there's always a bit of uh, <laughs> a tragic element there so that's right in there from the first Zatoichi film onwards and they return to a lot of these tropes but okay. after that first film when it's a surprise hit for Daie they decide to up the ante on the action and start making this an action film series yeah. and you see that quite uh, quite quickly from the second film onward, uh, onwards the imaginally titled and released in the same year so this is why it's had such an imaginative title and comes out the same year uh, the tale of Zatoichi continues <laughs> where it's set straight afterwards <laughs> Um, it's much shorter running time, but Zatoichi is killing more bad guys. Yeah. Oh, and his brother turns up. Uh, do any of you know who Shintaro Katsu's brother is? Uh, he also turns up as the brother, funnily enough, of, of the Zatoichi character in this film. His brother is Tomisaburo Wakayama. 
No, not not sure. Yeah, who is the the lead guy in No Wolf and Cub? Yes. Oh, that is, yeah, yeah, right. That is and, interesting. And Shintaro Katsu produced those films. Ah, yeah. Ah, okay, that's a, that's an interesting yeah. link. And um, yeah, um, uh, Wakayama ends up, ends up being a guest villain, if you like, in in two of the films, Zato which he continues and Chest of Gold, <laughs> as well as one of the TV episodes. Cool. <laughs> so he keeps having uh, fun killing his brother. Well, he doesn't kill him in the TV episode, but in the films that he turns up in, he is he is killed as the villain. So he gets to kill his brother a couple of times. It must have been fun for him. Maybe not his brother so much. <laughs> <laughs> doesn't get to flip it and. <laughs> no, he never. He never does. That's an interesting point you've mentioned. He, he doesn't turn up in Lone Wolf and Cub and get slaughtered. Shintaro Katsu, which is a shame. <laughs> so they're never quite even on that score. But I guess I mean those two series. I mean I'm more familiar uh, with the Lone Wolf and Cub stuff. But I guess yeah. they're two, you know, kind of iconic ones for especially for you know for Western fans could, and everything. And... Would you say that um, that could, the Lone Wolf and Cub, of course, came out of the the manga. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Would you say that actually there is a sort of weird synergy because is that quite influenced? And we can come out to influence a bit, bit more later. But is that quite influenced by the Satoichi films, or do you think that yeah. the influence in that Lone Wolf cover is from other? It's it's interesting because when those films come out, the Satoichi series is is almost taking a similar turn. Um, skipping along a bit because this would make your podcast, you know, much much longer if we went through it, but film by film. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, I have no problem skipping along here. About <laughs> the time, because I'm um, just trying to remember when they all came out. Because again, that's six films that comes out in a very short space of time. It's I think most of seventy two, isn't it's, it? It's it's actually most of them are sort of about seventy one, seventy two, uh-huh. seventy three, uh-huh. and then I think the last one is about is a few years later. Kind of officially, as I remember it, I've got the laziness over there. I can grab them and look. <laughs> I yeah, I had a feeling it was early seventies. They mm. all came out very quickly, yeah, and then all yeah, of a sudden they in... stopped. Because yeah. um, I've heard well, I've heard a few stories on this, but um, Tom Mez has, has also written a book on the Lone Wolf series, mm. who says okay. that Wakayama just walked out because they had <laughs> plans on you know adapting this to TV instead of film, and apparently he he wasn't impressed with doing that. Mm. Which is kind of odd because I've looked back through Wakayama's credits and, and just before um, Katsu took Zatoichi to TV, um, <laughs> him and his brother had made this series called Mute Samurai where Wakayama <laughs> plays plays a guy who's had his throat sliced so he can't talk but he's on a quest for vengeance, as you do. Mm. Um, so he had worked in TV already but yeah. for some reason they'd suddenly thought of changing the, the Lone Wolf and Cub formula after six films and he just quit. Or for whatever mm. reason. Yeah. Um, but at the same... Sorry, the point I was making mm. is that at the same time, in the early 70s, um, the Zatoichi series was making a similar turn into kind of out, outlandish violence and um, gratuitous sex sometimes mm-hmm. as well. Well, no, not entirely, because they were kind of reluctant to do that later on in the series because Zatoichi had always been kind of much more of a family... Uh, orientated en- entertainment. Okay. Um, the it, Criterion box set aside, I mean, it's a wonderful set, and it kind of, uh, as you know, with the label like Criterion, it establishes these films as artistic yes. to a certain yeah, level. Yeah. Yeah. That label's kind of wrong, as is the kind of exploitative entertainment label, which these films are also associated with because yeah. of association with Lone Wolf and Cub and things right. like that. Yeah. These were actually, you know, aimed as mass market entertainment by Daae just to get as many okay. people mm. in the cinema as possible. That's why if you do ever at, um, at any point, Andy, or yourself, James, <laughs> watch a lot of these films, you'll think there's a lot going on here. There's like a scene that kids will enjoy. There's a scene the adults will enjoy. Oh, oh and there's some sword action as well for the action nuts. So they, <laughs> they try to aim at everyone. And this is, this is kind of what um, Daae became famous but also infamous for because they did go bankrupt in the early 70s they were <laughs> this, trying this is reminding us of the, the, of the chat that we had about the the, the, the series with the the big guy the big the big stone guy you know the big stone guy we were talking about Damaging. yes Gaius, yes thank you I was going to say Gargantua yes know. yeah, yeah. Oh, and, uh, and I was thinking of Golem but this, um, this is a, a, that's a brilliant link to make because you know the studio that made them yeah yeah, yeah it's Daya as yeah well. yes, and, yes. and it's and it has the same there is that weird time especially when you get to the the, the i think it's the third film where yeah. they're, they're, yes. there's all the kids in there and it's basically right. a kids film it's like well hang on how do we get yeah. to this from so it is he, uh, yeah I'm, I'm recognizing the pattern here of what they do oh. yeah 
and we're tying the podcast together as well. <laughs> I guess you can go back and listen to the chat we had with Philip about that. No, they've yeah. heard it already, yeah. but they can we'll listen to it again. But they can listen to it again. I, I, I'd recommend it as well. Listen to that one. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. enjoy the Diamond Jim <laughs> films a, a lot. Yeah, so that's good. But how outlandish did these films get, though? Like, you I mean, it, did they ever get properly, really weirdly wacky, or...? Um, sometimes to the extent where there's there's some that I don't think are as successful as others. Some are fondly remembered for like the weird, wacky plot lines and stuff yeah. that they bring in. Like um, a lot of the trailers for these films you can still find online. One of the most bizarre, but it's also done by one of the best directors in the Zatoichi series, um, Kenji Misumi, who also directed a lot of Lone Wolf and Cub. Okay. Um, he directed a lot of the Zatoichi films. He's responsible for the first one, and I mm. think responsible for why that's so tonally different from a lot of the others. But he's also responsible for kind of the, some more wacky and comedic films, although he's not only responsible for the script, so technically I should say that it's probably up to the script writer. There's a film, Fight Zatoichi Fight, I think it's the eighth film, but I can't remember when it came out because they were just so close together. It might have been 64 or 65. Yeah. Um, Itchy has to look after a baby that he's found abandoned on the road. Okay. And right. it, you can see this in the trailer. He tries inexplicably, that's the one, yeah. yes. <laughs> uh, it's, it's in the picture there that you yeah. just found. Okay. Yeah. He tries inexplicably to, trying to breastfeed the baby <laughs> as a man. What? Yes. <laughs> Oh, fair enough. I'm not sure, not sure what luck. to say to that. Yeah, good luck, good luck mate. I don't yeah. think that's going to work out for him. What what what's also bizarre is again kind of skipping ahead a bit uh, um, is that some of these bizarre plot lines like some of the thought of back on as most of the famous and memorable plot lines are, are kind of um, redone again in the TV episodes. Some yeah. of the TV episodes are just like the Zatoichi films again, but in a shorter length of time. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, so yeah, they they try and they try and spice up the formula a bit, but they also try and keep it to what the audience is expecting. So after okay. which he's going to wander into somewhere, find who the bad guys are, kill them, move on. Did, did, did they had some crossovers with other stuff? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Everything. I mean, the one-armed swordsman? I mean, that's, yes. That's the, the famous one. I mean, that's and one, is, I, is one of the ones I've seen. Kind of talking about this, I mean, because definitely one-armed swordsman was influenced by Zatoichi, the idea of a, a disabled yeah. mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. you know, person, you know, or somebody who, is, in this case, is, is made disabled. Um, you know, learn, learning to fight again, learning how to use his left arm and mm-hmm. all that sort of thing. But, you know, you, you mentioned the the other title before, um, The Mute Swordsman. Is there this kind of weird sort of subgenre of, of samurai films where people have this emergency? Where does this come from? Mm-hmm. Um, kind of- yeah, there, there are, that's, again, a really good question. There are earlier roots to this, some of which I, I briefly talk about in the book, but... It would be a whole other book in itself, I'm honest, if you, if you wanted to chart that entirely. I found out through the research of Man Fung Yip, who's a scholar based in Oklahoma, um, that in Hong Kong cinema and also Taiwanese cinema, and he mentioned some South Korean titles, sadly, which I could find very little information for, um, there are some other disabled kind of martial arts uh, action films which crop up in the 60s and 70s mm. and again there's a question of you know how much is Zatoichi influencing that there's mm. there's um, I think there is a blind swordsman mentioned as a South Korean title there's some Taiwanese knockoffs which do- link directly to Zatoichi later f- following the crossover with the one on swordsman okay. um, which I'll come back to um, but yeah there's some interesting South Korean titles that he does mention in his book again I've struggled to find information on that but earlier Japanese influences that I could find on kind of similar characters that are disabled but mm. also to be feared for yeah. their swordsman like qualities um, yeah there are some early ones there's there's Tanga Sazen uh, oh I don't know if you've heard of who's, I recognize who's the name but I'm trying to remember uh, he's a character I hope I've pronounced that right as well Aaron Garo will probably tell me off who very kindly <laughs> endorsed the book and has a whole website called Tangamania all, <laughs> all about this character and his other interests in, in Japanese cinema so do do check that out if you're interested he probably knows a lot more about this subject than me but Tanga Sazen is a character who's appeared quite a lot on Japanese screens but usually through different actors he was uh, started off it was either a ma- oh, this is really bad. Either a manga or short story series in like a Japanese serial. 
Okay. Uh, so newspaper or magazine. And he is a one-armed, one-eyed swordsman. Huh. <laughs> uh, and um, he became known for first being quite fearsome in his stories and then one of the most famous stories that he uh, has been adapted onto screen a few times in films and TV is the One Million Rio Pot mm. and the amount of times that was adapted I think it was first adapted in the 30s if not the 20s but I feel safer betting on the 30s um, they kind of turned him into a more kind of lovable and roguish character and not so much more of a serious swordsman. Okay. And um, that's how he's often been portrayed again on screen since. So there mm. are some earlier antecedents mm, of kind okay. of wandering yeah, drifter yeah. characters and some of mm. them have uh, almost similar disabilities to Zatoichi, though he's not missing any limbs, he's just yeah. born blind. Um, or some of the films say he lost his sight as a long, young age. Some of the other stories say he was born blind. Um, but yeah, Tang- Tanga Sanzen is is an interesting parallel. Mm. Nope, that, that, that's cool. I mean, he also had stuff like uh, the Blind Beast and everything. Like that. Oh yes, there was yeah, quite, came quite later. A lot of these. Yeah, another yeah, another Dai film. Yeah. yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah that, that's why it kind of popped into my head. It's just there did seem to be a not I'm not going to say trend, but quite a lot of these, where they were across mm. different genres, where it was a focus on a, either a blind person or someone disabled. Maybe because they were like on, say, on the fringes of society or yeah. outside of society, doing yeah. doing something either extraordinary or extraordinarily sinister or bad. Yeah. Or yeah. yeah. So it's quite which you don't really get any, anymore so much, I suppose. No, I guess political correctness comes yeah. into that in some way, but yeah. also you know it's it's interesting that they're not because we're celebrating. Uh, but th- that you see some of big mainstream action films trying to do yeah. this now in terms of celebrating diversity and inclusivity sure. with having disabled people on screen from yeah. different backgrounds. So maybe it should happen, but maybe not in the way that happened back then. A very fine line. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah. You know, it can't be the problem. Yeah. And some of them, it's you know, it's clearly just it's not necessarily exploitation, but it's clearly just there's a gimmick or something. Yeah, like yeah. That. You, know, yeah. He, you know, the blind beast, he's, he's blind, he's also a pervert. <laughs> yeah. He's a killer. Yeah, that, you know? that would never get made again. But <laughs> you, you, have to, yeah. you have to wonder with someone like Z- Zatoichi, uh, yes. I guess the most notorious, the more notorious aspect of that is Shintaro Katsu's, you know, persona off screen yeah. that I mentioned earlier. Yes. That's perhaps more problematic now the character is played. But it is, it is interesting that you could argue to some extent, though I kind of make a different point in the book, the interest of Zatoichi seems to have died out. We haven't had a Zatoichi film since 2010. But for the reasons that you've you yeah. just mentioned, yeah, um, it could be an element of political correctness, but there there might be a possibility there to bring him back on screen to kind of celebrate you know, yeah. people with disabilities. At the same time, though, again, I touched on a little bit of this in my research, there is a, another trend of blind characters sometimes being hyped up as having extraordinary abilities, oh, which, mm. can, yeah, yeah. Yeah, oh, which yes, can be a yes. negative stereotype in itself. Yes, I did make links to Daredevil. <laughs> no, too. Yeah. Oh, did you have a shout out to Ben Affleck? <laughs> uh, no, no, I didn't end up shouting out to Ben Affleck in the end because I can't find any con- direct connection other than him being blind yeah. and incredibly athletic with the Ben Affleck film, but there's more direct connections with the... Uh, You've definitely got Frank the Marvel when Frank series. Miller yeah. was was doing it, because he, I mean, yeah. he ended up, I think he did artwork for the, this Criterion, but he did it for he did it for Lone Wolf and Cub. Right. Yeah, so he's, he's he's a massive fan. Yeah. of that's of, interesting. Yeah, I didn't, yeah, yeah, he brought in anyone else? Oh, I'd love oh yeah, lovely. Thank you, thank you. Um, he brought in Stick in the nineteen eighties. If that's you know right. you're dead, yeah, yeah, I do. Yeah. I, I don't. And I don't. I'm gonna, have yeah, you I do, seen the Marvel series yeah. with Daredevil? Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. Stick is introduced. Uh, as a blind man wielding a sword speaking Japanese tracking mm. down the Yakuza <laughs> and it's quite blatantly you know, like yeah, they're, they're yeah. making the Zatoichi connection and when he's first seen I, I think it's either in the comic it's definitely in the in, in the Marvel series he's first seen in military fatigues which I wonder is yeah. a, I wonder if that's a callback to Blind Fury because he's an ex-army right, veteran yes. in oh, Blind yeah, Fury. Yeah, yeah. So many links. There, there are so, <laughs> so many, many links. Rabbit holes no, one, the one, trouble is they would, yeah. somebody would have thought about that when they were doing it yeah I, yeah yeah because I actually one... think the original Daredevil could have been before Blind Fury with Stick yeah yeah I'm sure it was early 80s yeah it was early 80s yeah and there was also I haven't found evidence for this but the first Daredevil comic in from like the Stanley Jack Kirby Mm. era yeah that came out in 64 but I haven't found any evidence confirming if they were inspired by Zatoichi it's a possibility but I can't say for certain a bit of a 
coincidence, I guess. Yeah. If nothing else, if there was absolutely nothing. There it's at just all. how these films might have uh, have travelled, but they did. Sometimes yeah. they did, yeah, dubbed and, and yeah. whatever, and yeah. into a sort of yeah, forty eight. What was it? Forty second Street kind of grindhouse era. <laughs> <laughs> you know, with the Jack and people. Stan just going down. Let's watch this new samurai movie We're called Blind Man of Death or something like that. <laughs> Or, or some of them did go down the route of... Uh, very few um, came out of this, but uh, a few of the films could be linked to the trend of some samurai films inspiring westerns. Yes. There is that mm, side yes. of it too. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's that, that He doesn't appear often on the screen, but there have been a couple of blind um, gunslinger films. I don't know if you've seen any. Oh, that's a good... Oh, I don't think so. Nothing, no? Nothing's springing to no. mind. I, I, um, yeah, I could only mention two in the book which I can mention briefly. Yeah, yeah, whatever, one's, yeah. one's fun. I think you can find it on YouTube, if not some other video <laughs> streaming site, from 1971, Ferdinando Baldi's Blind Man. Okay. Very original title. Yeah, yeah, and it's Tony Anthony playing uh, the lead character who's a crack shot with a rifle, but is blind, as you do. <laughs> <laughs> Just... And I, right. I, I forget so, who's the main bad guy, but he's got... Uh, a brother who's equally villainous in the film, but he's kind of more famous in this film because he's played by none other than Ringo Starr. Oh, I have, I've read about this film many years. I know the one you mean. Now. Sorry, I, yeah. I haven't seen it or anything, but <laughs> yeah. I do. It's it's I worth a watch, but you might not want to watch it ever again after seeing it. <laughs> <laughs> it's it, it's it's, it's not it's, a glowing yeah. recommendation. Well, it's uh, it's not the greatest. I found it really interesting. Yeah. I don't think I'm going to watch it again. <laughs> but yeah, it it kind of. It kind of shows that the, the trend I mentioned earlier with where Zatoichi in the early 70s, you know, uh, suddenly injecting more sex and violence to yeah, try and keep yeah, people interested yeah. in cinema, which is partially down to Shintaro Katsu directly, not just because of producing the Lone Wolf and Cub films. Okay. Also in 71, he directs one of the Zatoichi films finally, right. called Zatoichi in Desperation, okay. where, um, uh, where he's actually deceived by a prostitute that he's trying to save, but she's yeah. actually on the side of the Yakuza, tries to get Zatoichi into bed so they can, uh, they can, you know, end him once and for all. Um, it's, it's quite a dark film. I mean, yeah. yeah, that premise sounds quite funny. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's quite, it's one of the darker entries. So he's almost directly responsible with that film, if you see it that way, for yeah. it taking this slant. And he's producing the Lone Wolf and Cub films. And then in 71, it's interesting that there's there's interesting parallels going on with Westerns and other genres around the world. They're in, injecting more sex and violence into their films to get keep people interested in the cinema. Yeah. This happens with Blind Man. Um, he ends up through, I can't remember what plot device, he's basically hired to take these women that have been captured to basically their male order brides for this mine that he's <laughs> travelling to. Yeah. Um, and he has to fend off this kind of villainous outlaws that just wants to capture the women for themselves. Yeah. And that's, that's where um, the lead villain comes in and his brother, played by Ringo Starr. <laughs> <laughs> so it's quite, that, yeah. that is quite exploitative that film you can yes. imagine from that plot so that's yeah. why I say not yeah. the greatest film I've ever seen interesting don't think I'll watch it again <laughs> yeah but it, it, it is interesting that there hasn't been you said it's in 2010 and there hasn't been a Zatuichi or everything and even for you know people who are just familiar with more with the Kitano film rather mm. than you know the backstory of it and stuff just with the, the the degree to which stuff gets recycled remade reimagined mm. and redone and stuff it's quite strange that there's not been anything because, I mean something like Lone Wolf and Cub you can see because it's not it doesn't quite have that same sort of high premise not gimmick but thing mm. you know blind blind master swords yeah yeah you, you'd think that might have been you know pulled up you know, once every decade once every mm. 20 years or something well you know? yeah he, he, yeah you'd say with Lone Wolf and Cub I think it has because again Tom Mez wrote about this in his yeah. book on Lone Wolf and Cub but actually it's more prolific and well known in Japan on TV Okay. Um, than the film series. I mean, right. it's uh, Lone Wolf and Cub is famous around the world because of films. Mainly, yeah. that I think that's down to the success of Shogun Assassin. Yes, yes. Um, which was a big international success. Um, but in Japan, it's uh, I think that story is more famous through the manga as well as the TV series. Okay. Um, which, of course, with a lot of Japanese TV, doesn't doesn't get exported uh, the way that uh, Japanese films do. Yeah. And it, it, I, I think it is kind of sad in a way that um, it, there has been a big gap now in mm -hmm. the time that we're talking about with the last um, 
appearance of Zatoichi on screen, but I did find a lot of homages, obviously, to the character that have come out since 2010. We've already mentioned Daredevil. don't think we've mentioned since we've been recording Rogue One yet. Right, That's yeah. another one um, that we can come back to as well um, later if we have time. There are uh, interesting homages. So there, there's good reason if a studio wants to. I think it might be Toho, perhaps, that still owns the rights. Okay. They could come back to this character because it wasn't so long ago we had Shin Godzilla, did we? Yeah, After yeah. they said, no, that's it. There's Godzilla <laughs> Final Wars. That's it. It's the yeah. end. They did bring him back. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, it could be done. No one ever dies. <laughs> no. No, one no, ever dies. There's no, there's no need to. Uh What's it, what was the last one you said 2010 was that 2010 a... yeah I can't really recommend that one either I'm, I'm afraid to say it was, yeah. wasn't the greatest success what on was screen. it called sorry it was called Zatoichi the last they were determined it was just Toho <laughs> again <laughs> Toho again determined to end the character once and for all we're not um, going anymore this is it yeah this is the last and, and like spoiler that. alert and I'm going to spoil it because it's not yeah, that it's... great a film they do kill him off at the end and oh, this is something okay. that had not been seen on screen before. Is that the death of Zatoichi, Zatoichi. Yeah. Right, right, right. And it's, it's not done very well because they're trying to reintroduce the character, reimagine him in a different way, go back to some of the source material. This is actually the only time on screen that you see him have a wife at the beginning. Okay. But of course, surprise, surprise, she tragically dies. Yeah, yeah. And she self is that. Yeah. Uh, and that becomes a big impetus for the plot, you know, finding out eventually who killed her and tr- him trying to get revenge. Um, that yeah, that comes much later on. They really do draw that out a bit. Yeah. Um, the guy, the guy playing Zatoichi, he tries to do the best job he can, but he just it just doesn't work on screen. It's Shingo Katori, who some listeners might know from the Japanese boy band Smap, and he's he's had a. Um, I think his film career has has continued. Uh, career on film and TV has career, continued since. Um, as you may know this happens a lot in East Asian countries you know if you're in a famous band you often go into film and TV acting Um, this kind of makes sense as well if you're thinking of redoing Zatoichi because Shintaro Katsu actually started on the stage as a musician and an actor and then became a film actor later and it would often be an excuse in the Zatoichi films for him to suddenly bring out the shamisen or start singing (laughs) Um, some of the the cameos in the film series and also in the TV episodes are like with famous female pop singers of the time that Zatoichi suddenly does a duet with and you know oh, that's nice. why yeah you know that's you know that's cool. why he's doing it he's yeah. getting the guest stars in so uh, that he can show off his other talents so you're basically getting a kind of the equivalent of the BBC variety show yeah. where you'd have Buster Springfield yeah. or Cliff Richard yeah. and, with some of them yeah, yeah you do kind of yeah it's really stars. interesting so you think with the later films it yeah. kind of makes sense to get one of these musicians turned actors sure. to mm. kind of um, you know reintroduce interest into the character but if yeah. you're going to kill him off at the end yeah, so like, what's the that's point that's yeah. pointless isn't it yeah. but, is it the female version of it there's the female version of there's well there's there's uh, more than one oh, female yeah. version of the character but the one that did get uh, I think uh, a little really small international release yeah it was Ichi? 2008 it was yeah. Ichi because it was yeah. very confusing because like, Ichi the killer as yes as well. so a lot of people were searching and right. looking I do remember being confused by that yes yeah. <laughs> confusing for for that reason and I, I i remember seeing the poster and realizing oh yeah okay they're doing a gender flipped version of zatoichi yeah. and i thought it would be really interesting to have this kind of refreshed um version of the character like yeah. a new iteration of the character actually it's it's presented as kind of these legacy sequels okay because it turns out that she is someone that was rescued and partially oh, raised really? by Zatoichi. Yeah, you okay. get these flashbacks okay. to a lookalike actor that looks like Shintaro <laughs> Katsu. And you're like, um, yeah. she's separated from him at some point, and that's the reason she's travelling along the road. She's oh, trying to find her former okay. mentor, and she never found out if that was her actual father or not, or yeah. just someone who okay. rescued her. So I did see it when it came out on the one of the... D- it, cause it was, I, remember the, I can't even remember yeah. the DVD cover, but... I can remember nothing whatsoever about it, <laughs> apart from that it exists. Unfortunately, it's a bit forgettable. It's better in the first half, where she okay. was established as this lone wanderer with yeah. these really good sword skills, and the main actress in it is, again, another one of these famous uh, models turned singers turned oh, okay. actors, okay. Haruka Ayase. 
He's right. been in some other yeah, films yeah, yeah, yeah. that I've liked. Mm-hmm. Yeah, she does a really good job in the first half, and then they just decide to inject all the romantic melodrama in the second oh, half. That's so, right. so, so that's, that's yeah, that's that's yeah, that's 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 where uh, again for the Japanese audience, I I understand yeah. why they did this. I address yeah. this in the book um, because the stars involved in it are in a very famous uh, Japanese melodrama, which I haven't seen that many versions of. I remember briefly watching one once. Um, one of these famous it's an adaptation of um, one of these famous books that is very well selling in Japan because they love okay. the romantic melodramas yeah. especially the tragic ones this one's called Crying Out for Love in the Center so of the know, World sure I've yeah. seen a couple of versions so, of that so the, the main characters that, who end up being the love interest in Ichi they've okay. each starred in a version of that story <laughs> so one's been in the film version one's been in the TV version so I kind of understand why in the second half they suddenly inject all the tragic romantic melodrama because yeah, okay. they're trying to cover their bases they want a reintroduction of the Zatoichi character but also they want <laughs> you know the star kudos of oh yeah. it's these romantic melodrama characters star cross lover yeah. uh, it doesn't work and um, I get to quote in the book um, Callum Waddle from Neo yeah, saying yeah. that it just seems like the writer had a brain fart and gave up in the second <laughs> half um, so I got, I got to quote him in the book and I can understand where he's coming from but I also say well they're doing it for this reason but still sadly it yeah. doesn't work it does, it does sound rather cynical yeah when, when, you, when you put it that pulling things together but uh, no I, I think I'm quite glad I can't remember it. Okay. <laughs> what, what you might be more interested in although they're not they're not great um, is Shochiku back in late 60s, early 70s. So this runs from 1969 to 71 with four films, tried to do a rival Blind oh, Swords Fighter series. And this was a woman as well. Oichi, oh. The Crimson Bat, these films were released internationally as. I don't know why. I don't think the actual name, The Crimson Bat, comes up as best <laughs> as I can find out through the <laughs> subtitle translations in the Japanese films. But for yeah. some reason, these were films were released internationally. As, as the Crimson Bat, there were four, uh, played by, and the lead was played by Yuko Matsuyama. Um, and uh, yeah, it just lasted for these four films. There's supposedly a TV series. I've never found any evidence okay. for it, though. Well, I, I haven't found any um, kind of video clips or anything yeah. for it, yeah. but it seems to be credited on a lot of sources that I found. Yeah. Um, but uh, I think it was Jonathan Clements who I ended up quoting saying he reckons that. Uh, Shintaro Katsu told Sh- Shochiku to back off and right. stop trying to muscle in on his sort of character. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that's cool. I, I, in terms of like general and like pop culture and stuff like that, I mean, it must. I mean, we'll, we can talk about maybe a bit about Blind Fury now. Uh, mm-hmm. Everything that because mm-hmm. it, it, it's even for someone like me who hasn't seen you know more than a couple of the films, like One Armed Swordsman, the Katana one, maybe one other, but it's such an instantly recognizable figure or character this the sort of yeah, like the yeah. blind swordsman and everything like that. yeah, so yeah, it's, yeah. it's definitely had it's, it's not like a disconnect but there's I think the figure has, has a much wider sort of reach into pop culture into figures especially for, yeah. you know whether it's video games whether it's Asian cinema whether it's western influence everything like yeah. that. even for people like who haven't seen the films or probably don't know anything about it just this idea of like the blind wandering swordsman yeah everything like that so is there any I mean, apart from you know blind fury has there been any other Versions in other countries, any other rip-offs, knock-offs? Yes, I, I can tell you about loads. Um, you might want to keep an eye on the time and tell me when to stop if you want. <laughs> uh, just throw a few people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll throw, yeah. Uh, I'll throw a few yeah. out. I'll try and keep this as brief um, then as possible. I forgot to mention the other Western earlier. There was one other oh, Western yes, with, a, with a blind gunslinger. I mentioned that before I forget. It ended up being as part of a HBO movie called Blind Justice. I think it came out in 92. Oh, Armand yeah. Asante. <laughs> plays plays yeah. uh, this kind of grizzled Civil War veteran that ends up becoming a blind gunslinger. Um, you can definitely find that on YouTube, I think. <laughs> watch, watch that if you want to. I found it quite fun, if I'm honest. Um, so, yeah, I kind of enjoyed that one. Um, there, yeah, there's so many others. Uh, 71 was Blind Man, who I mentioned earlier. Yes. Um, you, you could argue the one on Swordsman is perhaps an influence, and there was the crossover film, yeah. Um, yeah. which is the lo- loads of film fans say, oh, they think there's an alternative ending where the one on Swordsman wins, but no one has ever <laughs> seen it. Nobody can actually find <laughs> it. I know. No. I've, I've read about that. You know, yeah, from the one on Swordsman. But I think uh, I think you know this was this was Katsu's big cash cow at the time. I don't yeah. think he was going to agree. I don't think to the alternative cut of 
of the one on swordsman winning. And it doesn't explain in terms of knockoffs and impact. It yeah. doesn't. Ex- uh, I, I think this is partially explained by the Taiwanese knockoffs of Zatoichi that came later, Ooh, where all yeah. of a sudden there's some Taiwanese wuxia style films where Zatoichi turns up speaking Mandarin. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, fighting Wuxia style characters. The, uh, again, you can find a lot of this on YouTube now. Yeah. Uh, one is called, oh, it has two titles Blind Swordsman's Revenge or Zatoichi vs. the Flying Guillotine, because he does end up flying, uh, fighting someone with a flying yeah, guillotine in it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I've watched that. I've watched that. As soon as you see and, flying guillotine. Uh, okay, and that's, that's, <laughs> that's definitely the first films in these series. There's all sorts of websites that try to credit this and list where the, the Blind Swordsman has turned up in Taiwanese oh, Wuxia. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, um, lots of them say, oh, I think they all come in at 72. Oh, it's 74. So there's arguments over what the right order is. Yeah. But Flying Guillotine's definitely first because they suddenly throw in this um, plot line explaining, oh, yes, you've come back to mainland China now, finally. Japanese pirates kidnapped you and that's why you've been in Japan for so long. So this is this is the official Zatoichi sequel for the Taiwanese, the Hong Kong audience. He's some, and this is why he's suddenly speaking Mandarin now. So he was Chinese all along. Yes, he was Chinese all along. That's their argument. Yeah, oh, so he plays, plays that cool. character for a few films, but then uh, they might have been afraid of copyright issues. By the time they get to the fourth, <laughs> Trust and Brotherhood, which yeah. suddenly which suddenly leaps ahead to the like 1920s, 1930s era of Shanghai, going by the costumes in it, Zatoichi is suddenly in there. There's this ferocious martial arts villain, yeah. who I can't even remember the name of, but it's, the plot in these films, of course, is not important. But all of a sudden, <laughs> he kills off. Zatoichi <laughs> yeah and I'm like well yeah you were probably afraid of the lawsuit coming your way if you continue <laughs> doing this much longer um, and there was also um, I, I met some scholars who did um, going back to something you mentioned earlier did do uh, a weekend kind of uh, conference event at the School of African and Oriental Studies oh the sort of School of Oriental and African Studies sorry yeah. so uh, us oh, so uh, a couple of years ago uh, in 2019 Ekia Manjara and Hikmat Damawan, they told me a lot about Sea Buta, which literally means the blind. Okay. Who was a comic book character who turned up in 1967. Oh. He's like, he's basically Zatoichi with magical powers, as nice. you do. Yeah. yeah. So um, it wasn't until a few years later that the comic book author, Ganis Tehar, admitted he got the idea from Zatoichi, but he very much rooted this character in Indonesian mythology. Okay. Mm-hmm. Ended up appearing for the first time on screen in the 1970. And it's almost a similar story to Shin Tarakatsu. He doesn't make he doesn't make these films as consistently as he does, but eventually he ends up playing him on a TV series in the early nineties. This oh, okay. ends up being quite a successful part of his career. Ratno Timur is the actor's name. Yeah. Um. So he more, he almost has similar. I think he's also since passed away now, okay. sadly too. But he ends up having a similar success with the Sibuta character, almost to a similar level that um, uh, Katsu did. With with cool. with um, Zatoichi, who, as I I think I briefly mentioned earlier, after I'll do a quick rundown of the chronology. I can't remember if we went over that earlier. The Criterion <laughs> box set, if mm. you have that, yeah. that's the twenty five films that Shintaro Katsu made for Dae, predominantly Dae, because they go bankrupt, as yeah. I think we mentioned earlier. The mm-hmm. last yeah. few films in the seventies are released by Toho. Okay. Um, so he makes 25 films from 62 to 73 he's not done with the character then he decides to take him over to TV and that's for 1974 to 79 for 100 episodes Um, then it's 10 years of of Katsu trying to find other things to do with his career doesn't really work out he tries to come back as the character in 1989 um, it's an interesting film. I think it's found a, a life on DVD as like one of these cult films because it doesn't. Uh, not everything in it works. It's very strange. Okay. It's very. It's also very bloody. It's one of the bloodiest Satoichi film okay. I think that he made. Yeah. Um, you've got noses flying off people's faces <laughs> as well as limbs. All yeah, sorts nice. happening. Nice. Very. Um, that that doesn't work for him sadly. Yeah. Um, so he does twenty six films um, as this uh, as this character. Um, but you've then got in between there, you go Shotchiku Rival series, the Taiwanese films, yeah. uh, Blind Fury also comes out in 89. Yes. Um, and you've got Sibuta as well, making waves in, in Indonesian cinema. Um, but there are, there are other um, influences, of course, after that. You get the Japanese remakes, which are Kitano's 2003. Harika Ayase as Ichi in 2008 and um, Zatoichi the last in 2010. Yeah. Um, as I said, there's been no official uh, 
times that Zatoichi has been on screen since, as far yeah. as I'm aware, in film and TV in Japan mm -hmm. since then. But there have been homages, not to the character. We've already mentioned Daredevil. Yes. Um, there's Star Wars Rogue One, yeah. um, where Donnie Yen's character, Chira Timway, he, he admitted this himself in many an interview as well. He was a fan of the Zatoichi films. Okay. He probably he might have started off with a crossover with the one-armed swordsman. But um, okay. as far as I can tell from a lot of the sources that I found, the other films were being shown in Hong Kong cinemas a lot. So yeah. mm. hard to tell which was his first Zatoichi film. It's like asking which is your first James Bond film. They're all played on TV. <laughs> so many yeah. films. Yeah. Another interesting link there. They, they both start James Bond and Zatoichi in the same year. Make right. of that what you will. Mm. 62. <laughs> um, and there's been some other homages as well. The other ones that I could mention... Um, are, are actually kind of fan made shorts that you can oh, find okay. online there's one there's one that's very much a Star Wars fan film called Hoshino yeah. about a blind Jedi that's really interesting well worth a watch it's only like uh, seven or eight minutes long and uh, there's also a uh, American martial arts specialist and choreographer for many an action film called Eric Jacobus in the USA he's made some films called Blindsided which homage both Zatoichi and kind of Daredevil and Blind Fury all at the same yeah. time <laughs> And these fan made shorts he's made so there's there's there, there is global recognition of the character on lots of yeah. different levels yeah yeah, yeah absolutely uh, I think Blind Fury is you know for me that's probably still the best because I haven't <laughs> seen all these films and everything but you know seeing that when I was very young mm. and everything I, and you, you also it's, that kind of casting of Rick Cahow he's so a, good yeah, yeah. yeah. he is I mean, really good yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. It's, and, and it's, it's, it's kind of very kind of charismatic mm. best in that as well absolutely I think yeah. and it, it's one of the you know the best sort of genuinely really good action yeah. films of that period, you know, the sort of late 80s, that kind of time where there was yeah so much nonsense still coming out. Oh, really, yeah. You know. Nick Parker is quick as a snake. Strong as a bull. Not to mention blind as a bat. Nice doggy. What's your problem? You blind? Yeah. Holy shit. The Blind Zorro. If you can't handle it, get me somebody that can. Get me Bruce Lee. Bruce Lee is dead. He's get his brother. Wetger Hauer. I also do circumcision. Blind Fury. Yeah, I kind of tie it to kind of unfairly because it's a really good film on its own merit, but it does get kind of linked to all the pop Asian Orientalism that's going on in the 80s. Yeah, you know, they're making yeah. American Ninja into the yes, Ninja. Yeah. So it kind of makes sense for them to try and make Blind Fury as well. Yeah. But it, it has a lot going for it. It's very faithful to the Zatoichi film it's based on, Zatoichi Challenged, okay. in 1967. But that's actually the... Though it's only come out in 67, that's five years after the first one. It's the 17th film in the oh, series wow. so that, that's they're, how they're that's how quickly they're, they're really, making it so many, <laughs> yeah. so many year I mean, I, mean I thought Katsu's career was crazy for the Zatoichi films alone but then I scour through the rest of his IMDB credits yeah. and I've got some of this cited at the end of my book in terms of the partial filmography that I've put in yeah. he's he's making long running series alongside Zatoichi it's like he's <laughs> never not out of the film studio um, yeah. you know some people complain today about the cyclical nature of superhero movies yeah. Fast and Furious yeah. and the rest of it um, it's nothing compared to you know the <laughs> yeah. the, the, the the factory houses that are yeah. the film studios these days trying to churn out product. I mean, I, I've heard you guys speak on the podcast as well with Hong Kong films. Yeah, and they're they're producing yeah. stuff on a similar scale. Troublesome night. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> who directed Who directed Blind Fury again? Uh, that was Philip Noyce, uh, who's oh, Australian. Yeah. Yeah, yes. yeah, 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 uh, yeah, but yeah, now right. very, Fem very much an established um, action film director in the states. He did. Yeah. He did. Dead Calm must have been about the same time. Dead, uh, Dead Calm was just after. I think it's early nineties. Yeah. Yeah, very similar. Yeah. Yeah. Great, great film. Dead Calm, great film. Billy Zane, Sam Neill. And then um, I'm struggling to remember his entire filmography. Much, much later, he did Salt, the Angelina Jolie S film. Did he do Sliver? I don't think he did Sliver. I might be wrong on that. I don't. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm just going to pretend. I'm going to pretend. It's very much good fence and 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 quite American. Oh, he's a bit out of fence. Okay. Yeah, kind of out of fence. Did he do Sliver? Yes, he yes. did. Yes. Oh, ah, yeah, well yeah. done. You're right. I know my, I know my erotic thrillers. <laughs> <laughs> what? No, 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 no. Sorry. Yeah. Especially from the nineties. But he's he's a director. I just associate with that kind of nineties. 
mm. stuff. I think after the, after the 80s, he did churn out quite a lot of these yeah. sort of slick Hollywood thrillery mm. type productions, which mm-hmm. are fairly forgettable. I can't really remember Sliver. Um, Blind, uh, Blind Fury is um, also interesting for what Rutger Hoyer did for the role. You could argue that he's not making that much, much of an effort because he's one of these many actors yeah. that acts as a blind person with his eyes open. This is where Shintaro Katsu right. is probably still everyone's yes. fla- okay. favourite yeah. um, actor of the blind swordsman oh. because he always did it with his eyes closed. Mm. Or, although there are apparently some fans that have always argued, oh, maybe he could see all along because sometimes you <laughs> see him open his eyes, but Shintaro Katsu always rolled his yeah. eyes back. And if you remember the... Um, Kitano film, they kind of have a joke with this he at did, the end. Yes, I do remember eyes, that. Uh, mm. With his eyes being open. I won't spoil it, but they they kind of play with that um, thought of, oh, is he actually blind? I, remember, yeah. I do remember yeah. there being a bit of a jape about it, yeah. 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 Um, and, but Rutger Hoyer, he, I, I ended up finding out that he, he put a lot of effort into portraying a blind person, even oh. though you think he isn't, because he's doing it with his eyes open, which yes. is also what um, Yuko Matsuyama and so many other actors... Have, have done with blind sword fighters have actually played them with their eyes open um, there was a website I found I'll try and send you the link because it's yeah, still yeah. up um, it's <laughs> part of the Rutger Hoyer uh, official website I think where <laughs> he, he, he it's kind of a diary entry yeah. I think from him at the time they've put it on this website where he did um, shadow basically a blind martial artist that they found in the yeah. states oh, and, cool. and actually took some uh, official tips from them yeah. and then this takes me back to the fan made short that I mentioned earlier blindsided yeah. you can find some making of um, uh, material on YouTube as well from Eric Jacobus as to the efforts he's going to do yeah. just for this short film yeah. to play a yeah, blind character cool. and he again shadows an actual blind person to kind of get the mannerisms and everything correct so yeah. uh, 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 Blind Fury yeah is one of the better ones to try and iterate that and recapture that magic that yeah. Shintaro Katsu was so known for because um, they really did put the effort in and I suppose maybe I mean sort of linking back to something we said before like in terms of it not being remade now maybe that's Something as well, people might be in there. Is would there be any kickback from like a, a non disabled character yeah. playing in the role and stuff? I, I don't know, but it's, it's a difficult one, isn't it? Yeah, 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 yeah absolutely. It is, it is a difficult one because then if you say, Oh, it's not, we'll just have someone else playing, like Ben Affleck can play, <laughs> or play you know, it's time for Matt Damon to step up, you know. But yeah. there, then there's suddenly be a lot of flack and everything like that. And it's such a even in like the last five years, that mm. kind of stuff is put, and it's really. They're very hard to say what mm. you know what side of the fence that would fall on whether that would be seen as a problem or mm. or or not I don't know it's, yeah it's it's interesting um, to ask that for sure I mean yeah because it, it's an interesting age where we're in you can't yeah. tell how the reaction would be because uh, yeah. uh, 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 what's just won at the Oscars yeah, of course, of course. They, is yes, a film with yes. deaf actors True, yeah. very, so yeah, they're, they're, yeah. they're winning awards. Yeah. Um, yeah. Should there now be more opportunities for blind actors? Absolutely, uh, you can yeah. make that argument. Yeah, potentially. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But when we just throw into a couple of end bits about like recommendations for, for like the best favorite ones or for mm. a newcomer where to start with it or any part, yeah, you know, just like one or two of them because yeah. the box set is terrifying. Yes, exactly. Yeah, for yeah. Some, I mean, for someone like me, like who, yeah, who's aware of a big Asian cinema fan mm. to stuff but who, yeah who's terrified by the box set and seeing all these films mm. knowing how much stuff out there is there yeah. if you're picking a couple of ones which would uh, yeah get throw me right in there and everything and uh, yeah sure I mean um, uh, another thing I wanted to mention in relation to Blind Fury I think I did mention it earlier actually it's quite faithful to Zatoichi Challenge and that is actually okay. one of my favourite Zatoichi films so that's definitely a good place to start also yeah. directed by one of the best Directors of the series Kenji Misumi, okay. who became famous for so many other mm. um, action or oh, Shambara films uh, that he made later, um, especially known from the his work on the Lone Wolf and Cub series, yeah, yeah, and yeah. also the other film series that Katsu also tried to get off the ground. I forgot to mention that earlier when he's trying to get more uh, for the sake of Dae first of all, and then also Toho more sex and violence on screen. He yeah. also produced the um, Hanzo the Razor films. Oh, you seen yeah. 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 yeah, those were produced yeah. by him as well. Yeah, yeah. Did Arrow put them? I've got, that was I've, Eureka. Eureka. Yeah. Sorry, I've, yeah, I've still got that. I've, yeah, 
Uh, I've only watched one of them, I yeah. think, but it was pretty good what I saw. Yeah. So, um, basic, I, following from that, my point was um, a Mizumi f- directed film like Zatoichi Challenged, you can't really go wrong. Okay. Although, one of the ones he did also direct was the bizarre one I mentioned earlier, Fight Zatoichi Fight, where he's defending <laughs> the baby and also trying to breastfeed. <laughs> yeah, at the same I, time. Actually, yeah, yeah. I, I shouldn't have asked this question because that's <laughs> automatically the one I want to see. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it, uh, if you can get, if you can put that to one side, that's only a very short part of the film. I have to say the rest of it is really good actually there's some interesting choreography with him trying to change a nappy at one point and he's being attacked by the Yakuza so it's a hard boiled this kind of yeah almost yeah like almost 30 years years. so you're selling it did you try to breastfeed the baby hard boiled that would be great so basically (laughs) any Kenji Misumi film there's also one where the title makes this film sound dire but it's actually one of the best ones it looks gorgeous the fight scenes are amazing it's Zatoichi and the chess expert so it shouldn't, it shouldn't be a good film, but it is. That's it funny. really is. It doesn't sound very exciting. No, no, just ignore the title. Is, I, is he a villain, the chess expert? He, he is, actually, what's towards the, the end. Yeah. He's, he's, a, he's another one of these characters where Ichi makes friends with him and actually plays chess with him along okay. the way in the film, and they end up having to have the climactic Number duel. Number 12, end. okay. Yeah, yeah that's, that's really good. <laughs> that's um, yeah, so uh, you can't really go wrong with any of the Kenji Misumi entries if okay. you want to try and keep the numbers small, first of all, and then maybe get into the others if you're interested. Although there's some other directors in there that re- do some really good films. I mean, the first one is interesting for seeing how much of a contrast it is to the later films. Yes. And okay. also the director of the second one, Kazuo Mori, became a series regular. And actually a lot of people, I would include myself in this now, a lot mm. of fans of Zatoichi that write about the series online say the second film is one of the best. And okay. it's is fun to watch. And you also, um, if you like that one, you will also, because it, it's just a good film. It's not just because Wakayama's in there as well, but uh, Wakayama is the villain in uh, Tale of Zatoichi Continues and also Z- Zatoichi in the Chest of Gold, which is also well worth a watch. That's, that's directed by Kimiyoshi Yasuda, who's okay. another really good director in the series. No, I, 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 after all the chance, I am quite intrigued to dip my, dip my toe into it and everything. I'm just not sure I could commit to the... You know, admittedly gorgeous box set, and which is kind of hidden. It's sitting on the table here with this by the whiskey, and I'm kind of <laughs> hypnotized by both of them. <laughs> As I said, if it does sound too daunting, I have left online. It's just a WordPress site. I'll be honest. Yeah. Uh, my blog of watching all these films. In does, a short it space cra- of time. does it cra- get crazy towards the end? Then? Not well. <laughs> you could argue with Take Blind Fury. <laughs> you could argue with Blind Fury because I wasn't sure what I was letting myself in for. Letting my uh, watching this at the end. Like, yeah. is it worth leaving to the end? Am I going to be direly disappointed? <laughs> like leaving Zatoichi the last till the end, which I was disappointed at. I yeah. really regretted that. But then Blind Fury was a really good place to end on because I really ended. Oh, up I really want to watch, really yeah. watch Blind yeah. Fury yeah. again. Yeah. Now, yeah. I've got the DVD somewhere, but it's yeah. in my vaults. <laughs> well, not vaults. It's, it's in the giant bags which are just stashed behind my sofa. So I would, I would like to watch it yeah. again if I could find I, it. I also don't have a problem with there are there are some people that have a problem with the Kitana remake. Can you can you believe it? Because it was such a big success. Um, like I remember, I remember I'm, I'm always well. yeah, yeah yeah it's yeah. really good. I, I love it. And this is how I got into the Zatoichi series. But there is yeah. an author Patrick Galloway who I respect a lot has written a lot on samurai cinema. But he is he's one of these people not impressed with the. Um, Kitana remake probably because it's such a it's such a contrast from what Shintaro Katsu did but I Literally, really yeah, so yeah. Sounds yeah. Like it doesn't sound like a bad thing though yeah, yeah. You know. I mean um, if you can't you, 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 you yeah you can't do the same thing no there's not, so, not but, much point there's yeah. no yeah. point so doing something different yeah. I mean it's just interesting I think for people who come to Zatoichi via that then they are going to get something very different with yeah. 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 yeah did, did it win something at Venice uh, yeah, I think it got the silver line at Venice. It might have got the silver bear as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. It did, but it definitely was very well, you know, very yeah. well received. Very yeah, he didn't received. get the golden line for Zatoichi because he got that for Hanabi for fireworks. Right. Yeah. Well, but he did film. get the he did get the silver line, I think, at Venice, okay. and it's on the um, special edition DVD as well. It premiering at Venice and it getting the standing ovation, so you know it went down well. <laughs> How many minutes and, was it? Yeah. Like eight minutes, ten minutes, six minutes. Yeah, one of those. Yeah, really if, it's under, ones, if it's under like eight yeah. minutes now, they they like somebody, yeah, somebody who's actually timing. <laughs> yeah. They're like eight minutes. Shit. Okay, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Get some ringers at the back. Yeah, yeah. Do you think they're slowing down? Oh, something shouting something. Oh no. Do you think they now pay people to do that? I do. 
Yeah, 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 yeah. Definitely, yeah. Definitely, definitely. Yeah. Twelve yeah. minutes. Yeah. Right. Yeah, okay. Yeah. That's all right. No, no, we've got to go for fifteen. Otherwise, that's not <laughs> electric shocks on the seats. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, that criticism aside, that some people do have of the Kitana, I think it's a great film to start with as well. It's one of the yeah. most, I would say, well, possibly one of the most widely successful because you can actually get the DVD quite cheap online. Mm, the okay. Criterion box set. Is, is quite expensive. It is a big commitment, yeah. both for watching it and also buying it. I do highly recommend it, though, if you're interested in the character. Some of the other films, sadly, you either have to still buy on DVD, either imported mm. or otherwise. Zatoichi, the last, it didn't do well at the Japanese box office as well, so nobody so there's, bothered there's no, there's no with problem, international there's no distribution. Trying to... <laughs> no, I, I can't really recommend that. Unless you're an absolute <laughs> diehard fan and want to watch them all, if you're obsessed as I am, yeah. that's the only reason. Um, a lot of the other stuff, um, yeah, as I say, it's available on DVD. I think when the Criterion box set came out, um, those films did get put onto either the Criterion channel or Hulu okay. in the States. But other than that, if you try to find any of these on a streaming service, I think you can buy Blind Fury on Amazon, that's it. Yeah. Which is a good place to start, because yeah, it's a great film. Yeah, it's yeah. fantastic. I really, yeah. really, I'm going to probably have a few more drinks, go home, fall over the back of my sofa, <laughs> try to find it, give up and watch The Evil Dead again. <laughs> I don't have a problem with that plan either. I love the Evil Dead. It's such a either that or Hot Fuzz, probably, <laughs> because it will be on TV. Is it always? Always is. is. Always, always on TV. Yes, um, we always watch it every year in our house because it came out on Valentine's Day. Is our Valentine's Day movie? Oh, that's, oh, cool. that's actually that's really nice. <laughs> <laughs> Jonathan's book, The Pass of Satoichi, is available now from Rowan dot com slash Lexington. If you use discount code LXFANDF30, you will get 30% off the retail price. Well worth taking up. So thanks. Jonathan for joining us and it's a yeah, very enlightening uh, podcast on Zatoichi absolutely it's, it's 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 thanks for fun. having me it's fun. Uh, don't forget you can find all of our previous episodes on Apple Amazon Music Spotify Google or wherever you get your podcasts subscribe now and you'll never miss an episode <laughs> but for now cheers my glass is empty I can't cheers it's too bad it's bad luck <laughs> <laughs> but in theory cheers here's a drop in <laughs> <laughs> Semi-gonna!